Great. Well, it is eight o'clock in the morning here in Iceland. And just because we're online doesn't mean we should keep to schedule. Um, so I'll just say welcome everybody to the beginning of the first online Arctic Science Summit Week. Um, and I, I hope that all of you have had a chance to see some of the welcoming remarks that we, we posted on YouTube. Um, and if you haven't, they'll, they'll be available there afterwards. I should start out by introducing myself. My name is Alan Pope. I'm the Executive Secretary for the International Arctic Science Committee. Um, and thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll pass, pass you along to the presenters themselves. We have a great session set up for uh, discussing international science cooperation in the Arctic. And our first speaker today is going to be Ditte Nissenlund from the Danish Agency for Science and Higher Education. Um, we are going to try and stick to time. If you have questions along the way, you can put them in the Q&A box and hopefully uh, Ditta will be able to address them towards the end. So without further ado, uh, Ditta, over to you. Thank you very much, Ellen. Um, I, um, I'm very happy to, uh, to speak about the uh, Agreement on Enhancing International Arctic Science cooperation today. I work, at, as Ellen said, at the Danish Agency for Science and Higher Education with Arctic issues. Um, and one of my great tasks is to, to work with implementation of this agreement. So um, just a short um, agenda for what I hope to cover in this very short presentation, if time allows it. Um, otherwise, I'm sure that these slides will be shared and you are always welcome to contact me for further information. Um, I will just start with a very short spoiler alert. Um, if some of you are curious about further information regarding this agreement, this slideshow will end with some links to relevant resources where you can read about the agreement and find information of uh, Arctic scientific cooperation. I apologize uh, for giving away the ending, but there you have it. So um, at the Karuna ministerial meeting in 2013, a task force was established to work towards an arrangement on improving scientific research cooperation. That led to the uh, writing of this agreement that was signed in May 2017, after which followed a ratification process in each of the participating countries, which are all of the Arctic countries. The main focus for the agreement is access. And by that, we mean facilitation of access to areas, infrastructure, data, etc. So uh, the current status of the, um, the agreement is that in March 2019, all parties has, ra has ratified the agreement and we are now in the next phase of implementing it. Um, the agreement is a statement that the parties are willing to stretch themselves to the maximum within the existing legal framework. In the report on scientific cooperation within the Arctic, understanding the bottlenecks in cross-border research, um, Ward, Latula and Vlasova ask the researchers about their experiences. I have included a link to this uh, report um, if you're not familiar with it already. Um, Generally, access to data and access to areas seems to be the two fields where researchers find it most cumbersome. Um, we haven't had any reported real barriers, but researchers might find, still find that things can be difficult and time consuming. For instance, getting the right permits for research projects, getting visas, access, etc. So it's important for me to stress that this agreement was never a promise that everything would be easy but it should ease the collaborative effort to minimize and with time abolish any real barriers. So um, the agreement covers uh, the uh, geographical area you can see here in the unofficial uh, map. Uh, and it also covers eight scientific areas uh, where the parties should work to eliminate or diminish barriers for Arctic scientific cooperation. While declination, declination of requests for access is rare, there is an experience of unnecessary bureaucracy among researchers, which affect the practicalities of conducting research. 
Now that the follow-up meeting regarding implementation, which should have been tomorrow, is postponed, I would like to pinpoint that this is important to keep inform informing the relevant parties about experiences of barriers and challenging for scientific cooperation. Uh, we think it is relevant to investigate whether the existing forests such as IASC, FARO, European Polar Board, etc., and the working groups under the Arctic Councils can be used to raise and discuss these challenges. I would like to stress that we keep tracking the implementation of this agreement and that the research communities play a key role in con contributing to raising awareness of experiences with barriers or obstacles. How we handle and implement the agreement is consistently developing and getting solid information is a very important factor in making this agreement a success. If the research communities are not reporting obstacles and barriers, it will be difficult to improve conditions. Therefore, it's also important for the parties to raise awareness in the research communities about the agreement and about the importance of reporting obstacles. So the agreement confirms that there are some specific challenges for international scientific cooperation in the Arctic region. Be that the regulatory framework conditions when navigating between eight sovereign states, territories and international law and soft law, or be that the challenges of the infrastructure of the region. The agreement can be seen as an underlining of a well-functioning state of affairs. The scientific collaboration in the region is to a large degree functioning and flourishing, and this agreement can thus be seen as a recognition of the importance of science in the Arctic region and as an international field highly dependent on collaboration. The agreement also sends a signal to the surrounding world that Arctic science is important and that scientific co collaboration is important, both to the non-Arctic stakeholders and to the non-science stakeholders in and outside the Arctic region. So for my concluding remarks, the task ahead of us is to facilitate implementation in all party countries. Denmark as depository for the agreement is currently working on a suggestion to be presented to the parties at earliest possible convenience. And we look very much forward to that, might I add. We still need to address barriers to the best practice. Therefore, it is also relevant to have a dialogue between the parties of the agreement about how to handle issues raised by non-parties. And obviously also to have a dialogue between parties and non-parties to this agreement consistently. So that was actually the end of my slideshow. Thank you for listening. Great, thank you so much, Ditta. Um, so we are wonderfully a few minutes ahead of schedule. And so if people have any uh, questions, they are welcome to use the little Q&A box. If you hover at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little Q&A um, and you can put questions in there um, for us to be able to respond to. Um, or you can use the little raise hand function on the participant list. Uh, and we could also allow you to uh, turn on your microphone if you would like to uh, ask a question that way. Um, I guess I'll start off by asking Ditta. Um, I assume you don't know the answer to this, but has there been any discussion yet of when a next meeting uh, regarding implementation might take place? Well, Ellen, we had hoped it was to be tomorrow. Indeed, but, um, indeed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but current circumstances, unfortunately, does not allow us to do that. So hopefully sometime in the fall when everything is more or less back to normal. I, I think we uh, we all agree that it should be at the earliest possible convenience, but also at a time when it's it perhaps suits the parties best if there is an, a diff, another event, uh, just as we had the Arctic Science Summit week uh, this week, that was a, an ideal event uh, for, for a meeting, so. Okay, thanks. 
Oh, I can see uh, we had one question come in. Ditta, can you see the the written the questions coming in in the Q and A box there? I can, and I think that's Great. a very good question. Um, um, so just so you know, you can okay. see the questions, but the the other participants can't. So when you're answering it, um, please do read the question okay. out loud. Okay. So the first question is: Which countries are exactly involved in this agreement only arctic countries presented on the map um, and yes the agreement is signed by the eight arctic nation states or um, states and and that that is sort of uh, the members of the arctic council and and obviously this affects a wider uh, range of stakeholders and that is also something that we need to address in uh, in our implementation dialogue um, and I think that also covers the next questions about whether I could tell more about Japan's and Korea's role in this in the scientific research. Um, I suppose there is information available online, and and we have a very uh, good dialogue in the research communities with uh, these countries. But but as non-Arctic uh, states, they are not a member of the they're not a party to the agreement as it is today. Uh, which is a procedure to rise a problem is a different uh, question. And that is a really good question. Um, the different parties have, uh, I think, uh, different procedures, but, but I think most of us has a sort of a, a online uh, form you fill in and it is uh, sent, the researchers fill it in, answers a few questions and it is sent to the um, the relevant party in the um, in the country, the relevant uh, authority that uh, handles the implementation of this agreement, and then there will be a dialogue between uh, that authority and the relevant other authorities. If, if for instance, uh, a, a a party or non-party member uh, from outside the Kingdom of Den. Denmark has an issue with access to to uh, areas in the Kingdom of Denmark. We will we will take a dialogue in in the Kingdom. They will raise the if they are party, they will probably raise a question to their own authority, and that authority will contact the Danish authority, which is us in the Danish Agency for Science and Higher Education, and we will have a dialogue about it. If you are non-party, you would probably report it to directly to the Kingdom of Denmark authorities. Um, is a is a possibility for observers to propose items. Um, I think that's something we need to have a, a dialogue on. But obviously, if observers experience or party researchers from from non-party countries experiences obstacles, they should definitely also report on them. Um, what what is the process to address complications that arises with the respect? to allowing access. Um, I think I just explained that also. Um, so will you be making an effort to include indigenous nations? Um, I think we actually already are uh, in, in a very good dialogue with, with the indigenous nations. And I think that, that is a very important uh, factor also. How do you see the implementation dialogue with non-parties actually happening? That's a good question. And I think that is something we should definitely talk about on our next implementation meeting. I don't have a fixed answer to that just yet, unfortunately. Thank you for so many great questions. Yeah, that was great. And and we um, are basically just at the end of, of our little window of time, unfortunately. Um, I know there were some links at the end of the presentation. Uh, and again, all of these will be shared on the I Ask YouTube channel afterwards. So thank you very much, Ditta, for your presentation. Um, we will move You're on. very welcome. Thank you. We will uh, move on next to a presentation on updates on the third Arctic Science Ministerial. And our first part of that presentation is going to be given by Lindsay Arthur from the Icelandic Ministry of Science, Education and Culture. Um, so if you'll just bear with us for a second, I will stop sharing my screen and invite Lindsay to share her screen and start the presentation. Okay.
So, all right. oh, great. Yep, all set. Okay, so um, my name is Lindsay Arthur, and I'm a project manager at the Icelandic Ministry of Education, Science, and Culture. And um, I first just want to say, you know, thank you so much to all of you who are joining us, especially those of you who are in North America. I actually physically don't know how you're <laughs> awake right now, but <laughs> thank you for being with us anyway. Um, so I'm going to talk about the third Arctic Science Ministerial and just kind of give you some background on what the planning process has been and where we're going. So the third Arctic Science Ministerial is being co-hosted by Iceland and Japan. Um, the meeting is planned to be held in Japan in November of this year. Um, and this meeting is also being coordinated alongside the Arctic Circle Japan Forum, um, which is being held in Tokyo the 21st through 23rd of November. So we thought there was a really good opportunity um, to bring the you know, international Arctic science community together for both of these meetings to kind of um, coordinate and discuss these important topics at the same time. So just to give you some background on the Arctic Science Ministerial, as you can see, this is only the third one that's being planned. Um, so it's relatively new in its conception. Um, so far, it's been happening every two years. So the first one was held in Washington, DC, um, and that was hosted by the United States. And then the next one was in Berlin in 2018. And this was co-hosted by Germany, the European Commission, and Finland. What makes the Arctic Science Ministerial really unique is that this is, you know, 26 or potentially even more governments coming together and talking about the most urgent issues in Arctic science research and especially what matters that really come together um, in the spirit of international collaboration. So it's trying to get that bigger picture of what we can achieve as an international community in terms of scientific research that we're not able to do alone. As you can see, it's it's not just sort of um, only for the Arctic states, but this is for any government that is engaged in Arctic research. So that also makes it a really unique meeting. Of course, we also have input from um, Arctic science organizations, as well as the six Arctic indigenous organizations. So just to give you some background on who the planning team is for the third Arctic science ministerial, from Japan, we have the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology, um, which is also known as MEX. Um, and they're also being supported by the National Institute of Polar Research in Japan. In Iceland, uh, this is being taken up by the Ministry of Education, Science, and Culture. But we also have a local consultative committee that is sort of made up of different uh, institutes and organizations in Iceland who are all really a critical part of our process. And then we've also convened a science advisory board. So this science advisory board is really critical to our process. Um, the way that we went about it is we consulted with different uh, Arctic science, international Arctic science organizations and had them each nominate somebody um, through their own internal process to be part of our board. So here you can see the composition of our board and we really, rely on this board to give us input on the science process for this meeting, as well as just the science input that will um, ultimately end up in our science summary from this meeting, as well as the joint statement signed by ministers. So what I wanna really talk about today um, is our science to policy process. And after this overview that I'm giving about you know, what ASM is. Um, Hiroyuki Anamoto from Japan's National Institute of Polar Research is going to be going more in depth into kind of one example of what our science to policy process is. But really, you know, this is, um, the ASM really serves as the place where Arctic scientists can kind of engage um, on multiple levels. And then that you know, knowledge and research and urgent issues are kind of passed up to the policy level. So our desire for ASM3 was to kind of interface at three different science meetings throughout 2020. 
uh, the purpose of these meetings is really to give the research community an opportunity to shape and develop the science policy process that will result in the Arctic Science Ministerial Joint Statement, um, which is meant to be si signed in Tokyo by all of the ministers who come together. So for those of you who are familiar with the second Arctic Science Ministerial, which was held in Berlin, um, they held a science forum the day before the ministerial meeting. And this was a really wonderful opportunity for the international Arctic science and research community to come together and talk about you know, their research goals, what they see are the most urgent issues, and what are the real opportunities um, for international collaboration in science research, and talk about those things and you know, potentially allow policymakers to hear directly from the science community. So for the ASM3 planning committee, uh, we thought that was a really great idea to bring scientists together in that format. We decided to kind of move that format for the science forum into a year long process instead. So instead of having it the day before the ministerial, um, we thought we would kind of bring the ASM to these three different Arctic science meetings happening throughout 2020. Um, at each of these meetings, the plan is to have an Arctic science ministerial process and kind of open meeting um, with the science community. And then from that, a white paper would be drafted. That's kind of a summary of what we're hearing from scientists and researchers. And then that white paper would both be published on the ASM3 website and then given directly to the organizing committee and science advisory board to implement what we're learning from these meetings into the joint statement to be signed by ministers. So obviously um, things are a little different in 2020 than all of us had planned. So we're looking at doing things a bit differently um, with Arctic Science Summit Week, for example, this meeting has been moved online. The first meeting that we intended to highlight was the sixth international symposium on Arctic research in Tokyo. Um, Hiroyuki Anamoto, who will be speaking after me is gonna speak a little bit more about this. And then the third meeting we were targeting to have this ASM3 process at was um, the International Congress of Arctic Social Sciences, which was to be held in Russia. We've just learned that this has been postponed until 2021. So at the moment, we're a bit fluid with what this looks like, but we are determined to still have an ASM3 process come out of each of these meetings. Just might look a bit different than we originally intended. Pertinent to ASM, ASSW, um, we were supposed to have an ASM3 meeting on the 29th. Uh, the intention for this was to have a community meeting and we were working in collaboration with IASC and APEX um, where we intended to invite international and regional Arctic science organizations, including IASC, IASC partners, IASC working groups to submit comments um, to documents. So, each organization and IS working group was invited to submit comments to the four themes for the Arctic Science Ministerial. And then we would have sort of a consultative process um, with presentations and discussions on uh, each of the documents that were submitted. And then from this, the chairs um, of this session from IASC and APEX would take all of the feedback received and create an executive summary, which again, would we would take that and um, publish it on the ASM3 website and then use that to inform the drafting of the joint statement for the ministerial itself. So we are gonna move this meeting um, online and as everything in our process has been moved back a little bit um, due to all of these recent changes, we're looking to host that meeting um, in late spring. So in about four to five weeks. So we will keep all um, relevant parties who are interested in that meeting up to date with how that changes. But there's another um, component that is happening as part of ASSW and the Arctic Observing Summit. So we really see like ASM3 is kind of a key audience for the recommendations that come out of the Arctic Observing Summit. So we will also be part of that process, um, members from our Organizing committee will be part of the Arctic Observing Summit. And then the intention uh, is that our minister from the Icelandic Ministry of Education, Science and Culture will be giving the closing speech from AOS. 
um, the intention there is that, you know, we are really listening to the deliverables from AOS and our minister will be taking those deliverables directly to the Arctic Science Ministerial meeting in Tokyo. So that's our intention um, for AOS and ASSW. But what's wonderful is we also have an online feedback form. So here you can see we have an ASM3 website um, very simple, asm3.org. We have a feedback form that's just midway down through the website. And this is really intended for you, the international science community. Um, we want everyone who has a stake in this process for the Arctic Science Ministerial to be heard. So we have a feedback form where we'd like to hear directly from you. You can give us your feedback, what issues are most important to you, what do you wish policymakers understood um, about your research? So please, if you haven't already filled out the feedback form, go to asm3.org and you can give us your feedback directly there. So I just wanna to touch briefly over what our process has been for the development of themes and then the deliverables um, for this meeting. So we're taking the themes um, from ASM1 and ASM2 and sort of iterating them, we wanted to give the themes a bit more of a narrative arc um, and take what's already been done, but think about how they work together. So we're sort of thinking, you know, first you start with observation um, and then you work to understand and then you develop a response and then you strengthen um, that response. What's really important here uh, is we've reintegrated education as kind of a key component within the theme. This was not part of ASM2 specifically, so um, we're bringing in a new focus on education to our theme. And so as we have this process for the international science community um, through engaging at each of these three meetings as I outlined previously, we also have a process um, for national and organizational deliverables so than before and kind of updating that process, making it easier for countries to engage, hopefully asking questions um, that are even more specific um, and giving countries really the opportunity to talk about what are our key operations in Tokyo. We have um, two days outlined, the 21st and the 22nd. On the 21st, we'll be having a science fair. This is a less formal opportunity for those in attendance, both from the science community, those are, who are in attendance for the Arctic Circles um, Japan Forum, and then also the policymakers who are part of the ministerial meeting to come together, um, talk with each other, interface in a less formal setting, and kind of talk about the scientific research opportunities that are highlighted in the ministerial. And then on the 22nd, we have um, all day for the ministerial set aside for ministers. But as I said, we're coordinating this with the Arctic Circle Japan Forum, which is happening the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. So there is an opportunity for those who are not specifically engaged in the ministerial meeting to have increased dialogue um, and talk about kind of some of the bigger picture issues that might not fit specifically into the ministerial meeting. Um, but are really worth discussion. And hopefully having that Japan forum um, alongside the ministerial, we're having more opportunities for dialogue and discussion. So <laughs> as you know, 2020 has been a different year for all of us in terms of planning. Um, these are uncertain times, but what is certain is that international cooperation is clearly more important now than ever. What we're seeing today is that we have the chance um, at meeting truly demanding global challenges if we work together, if we share expertise, and if we move at speed and scale towards shared objectives. So as we are moving forward in the planning process for ASM3, our organizing committee members from Japan and Iceland will work closely with countries and international Arctic science organizations to develop a collective action plan around the most urgent next steps to take in international Arctic science and research. 
we can't predict how this year will unfold, but um, we will keep you all informed with our planning process. And as we make a decision about the timing for this meeting, if we need to move it based on what's happening with uh, global events, we will keep everybody up to date. And of course, we'll be working um, with the most up to date information from the World Health Organization in terms of what we should do. Uh, right now, we are going forward with the planned dates. But like I said, we're just remaining flexible and nimble in terms of um, altered plans that we might need to make in the future. So with that, I'd like to introduce um, the next speaker who's also talking about the Arctic Science Ministerial, Hiroyuki Enamoto from Japan's National Institute of Polar Research. And he's gonna be specifically talking about the ASM3 process for ISAR-6. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. So I would like to start my talk and I will uh, share the screen. I hope you can see the screen. Yes, we can. Please do go ahead. Thanks. Thank you very much for a general presentation, so introduction of the ASM3 preparation by uh, Lindsay. And I would like to uh, explain the ongoing uh, process of the ASM3, especially ISA6 online meeting. I'm from the uh, National Institute of Polar Research, Hiroiki Enomoto. So uh, this is already uh, indicated uh, before science to policy processes. So how to bring the scientists' idea, knowledge, and uh, many thought to the ASM3 is a big issue. Already ASM1 and 2 had a very big challenge. And but uh, in the ASM3, we trying to the, uh, bring more uh, uh, knowledge and ideas to the uh, meetings and to the finally to the joint statement and uh, the below there is a three uh, meeting name isa6 we plan uh, isa6 in the uh, internal symposium of um, arctic research isa6 was planned uh, two to six march 2020 this year but uh, unfortunately uh, we could not open the face-to-face uh, -face, uh, symposium and now the uh, symposium is moved to the online meeting and in this week, you uh, next week you have AOS, and uh, the third meeting is now the preparation how to bring, uh, uh, so bring the do, those ideas to the SM3 uh, processes. So now I would like to in, uh, introduce the uh, ongoing trial of, from the other uh, SM3 input from the ISA six. Uh, symposium on online meeting. So I quickly, briefly introduce the International Symposium on Arctic Research, ISA. This, uh, this year was the sixth year, uh, sixth uh, uh, symposium, and starting the first symposium was held in 2008. And the first three uh, meetings are rather a small number of uh, country, but uh, Recently, the number is very much increased, especially for the 2018, 26 countries, 340 participants. And so it, it becomes an international symposium. And so we wanted to use this opportunity to, uh, to get the scientist idea uh, to bring the ASM3 processes. And this is uh, uh, this year we uh, collected uh, so many uh, presentation registration and 390 oral and poster uh, presentations are uh, registered for ISA 6. And 200 are from abroad. So uh, this is not the national uh, 
the symposium, but the international symposium. And the regular sessions and special sessions, 25 sessions in, in total. And uh, ISA 6, uh, so front, special session for scientific contribution to the ASM 3. So a uh, symposium statement will be released from the A for ASM 3 based on the input from all session and the special session. So uh, now the uh, collecting idea process is uh, ongoing. So there is the ASM 3 special session, but from all sessions, uh, people can uh, put the idea to the I ISA 3, ISA 6 website. This is a list of the session titles. Uh, sessions are freely so interdisciplinary and covering wide range, not only the natural science, but social and human sciences and policy is, uh, in, is uh, in the uh, se sessions. And some keywords of the uh, uh, ISA 6 uh, presentation. And for example, Arctic observing social, observe, Arctic observing and social and societal benefits. Say on roadmap, data system, open access, sustainability of observing system. So uh, here I just uh, briefly listed the uh, presentation keyword, keyword of the presentation. Uh, predictability of the weather climate, capacity building and science diplomacy, and also natural resources, community-based monitoring. So many uh, presenters registered. And now you can see the presentation material online. So ISA 6 moved on online uh, meetings and presentation materials was now on the uh, web page of the ISA 6. So online meeting is running now. Uh, presentation uh, material was also uploaded by uh, today. And core discussion period is from uh, tomorrow to 10th April. And th through those processes, uh, collecting short statement from session conveners, all session 25 com session conveners uh, can uh, uh, summarize the uh, idea from the, those sessions. And special session presenters also can uh, make uh, send us so statement. And the right hand side, you, you see the online meeting uh, web page. Welcome to ISA 6 online meeting. And you can sign in. And then you will see the, uh, this is the example of the one uh, presentation uh, materials. You can see all presentation materials. and. Uh, then you can write your comment to the to that uh, site. So we are uh, so you are very much welcome to uh, put your idea and comment to the uh, ISA six. And so it is finally so all the ISA six has moved to the online discussion. Uh, we we keep uh, working on the preparation of symposium statement. Uh, session conveners and the symposium organizers are going to release symposium statement from ISA 6 as direct input from the research community uh, to the ASM 3. The, so you can write the comment and the idea uh, to the ISA 6 uh, uh, website. Yeah, so please visit the ISA 6 page also, and some discussions if you have any questions. Thank you very much. This is uh, that's all my presentation. Thank you very much, Hiroyuki. So we have about five minutes left for any questions uh, for either Lindsay or Hiroyuki. Uh, and the first questions are coming in. Um, so I will let Lindsay and Hiroyuki take it away. And if you would like to turn on your cameras to take the questions, I'd invite you to do so as well. Um, Lindsay, can you see the, the questions that are coming in? Yep, I can see the questions. I can't turn on my video. I think those are your controls for some reason. Oh, well, I can see that. So well, I can go just, for, uh, No worries, yeah. go for it for now. <laughs> I'll read out this first question. Will you be asking process reports um, from the deliverables presented listed in ASM2, or is there any follow-up on those? That's a great question. Um, yes. 
that's a big part of the deliverables package, which we will be sending out to countries and organizations very shortly. Um, and a big part of that is following up on the process from ASM2. We definitely don't want to leave any of that information dangling. And I think what we're starting to see in building um, from ASM1 now to ASM3 is that we will start to have this legacy data of what is submitted to each of these meetings. So we're trying to track that better, organize it, and keep it. So yeah, thanks. OK, next question. From a perspective of research community, what will be the main practical outcomes of ASM3? Will the process eventually result in more targeted research funding, for example? If so, what is the role of contribution of national and international funding agencies to the whole process of ASM? Thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, yeah, this is something that we are thinking about. First of all, with ISM3, really making the practical outcomes um, extremely clear. And we're still trying to define that specifically. Um, but one of the really practical outcomes of ASM2 was the start of what's called the Arctic Funders Forum. So we had kind of an initial pre-meeting of the Arctic Funders Forum in October uh, alongside with during, sorry, um, Arctic Circle in Reykjavik. And we were actually planning to have the sort of second pre-meeting of the Arctic Funders Forum during ASSW. We still are having it, uh, but it's just online on the 30th. So that is kind of one of the tangible outcomes of the ASM that is going forward um, to get funding agencies together to talk about like how we achieve these goals um, specifically through funding and contributions. So uh, about the ICAS 6, I, I would try to uh, answer. Yeah, so, go ahead. Uh, hi, how is the statement going to be reported without ICAS 10? So it's a uh, we uh, plan to get the information from three symposiums, uh, ISA 6 and AOS and ICAS 10. So uh, the two so symposium uh, uh, will be held by online. And ICAS 10's decision was uh, done very recently. And uh, I hope uh, uh, ICAS 10 uh, organizer will share the uh, system with ISA 6 or AOS, uh, how the uh, online was effective. And I would like to uh, talk with the uh, so organizer, we talk to the, with the ICAS 10 organizers uh, to get the, their uh, so function to uh, get the uh, idea through the ICAS 10 uh, audience. So that's yeah. the yeah, and I can just add to that. I think that there is potential that there could still be some online components of IS, ICAS 10, even if the entire meeting is postponed till 2021. So potentially we could still have um, an online meeting sort of similar to what we're doing with ISSW um, for ICAS 10, just specifically to get that ASM3 uh, dialogue and information. Great, thank you so much to, to Lindsay and Hiroyuki for the interesting presentations and taking all those questions. Um, perfectly kept to time so that we can move on to our next speaker, uh, who is Olaf Ragnar Grimson, who is the former president of Iceland. Um, and so he is joining us over phone. And so hopefully, um, I just gave him permission to talk and he can hear us and I'll invite him to, to speak now. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm deeply honored to be able to join your discussion, although it is under somewhat uh, strange, uh, strange circumstances, as we all know. But let me try to summarize where, from my vantage point, uh, international cooperation 
on Arctic science uh, is at the moment. And Sorry what to, are... to interrupt you for just a quick second. Yeah. Um, I made a, a, a little yeah, sure. mistake. I wanted to, to check that your phone worked, um, but I think- well, well, I, my um, phone, I hope my phone works. Yeah, yes, sure. it, it does, it does. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I think that Thorsten Gunnarsson from uh, Rannis might have had a little introduction for you prepared that was oh, okay. a little more uh, uh, elaborate than mine. So I'll, I'll just see Thorsten, well, well, uh, do you want to speak up now? He's muted, so we'll give him just one second. Otherwise, um, we'll, we'll, well let you continue. Well, I'm perfectly happy to speak without an introduction. I mean, it's fine. <laughs> okay, my apologies for the interruption. Go ahead. Yeah. So as I was saying, um, uh, I will uh, just uh, summarize where I see Arctic uh, International Science Corporation standing at the moment and mention a few of the main challenges uh, as we go into uh, this uh, this new decade, but I think it is worth remembering as we go forward how incredibly uh, the uh, transformation in the last half a decade or so has impacted Arctic cooperation. It was only in 2013 that, as we all know, the Arctic Council accepted uh, China, Korea, Japan, Italy. India, <clears throat> Singapore, and others as observer states. And if anybody had predicted at the Corona meeting that uh, uh, within uh, less than a decade, uh, they would all have become very active players in uh, Arctic science and Arctic cooperation on a scale that we have seen, I don't think anybody would have believed that, that scenario. And in the same year, 2013, some of us got together and decided uh, to establish uh, what we call the Arctic Circle, announced it at the National Press Club in Washington in May of that year, and declared we would have the first assembly six months later. And everybody thought we were actually crazy to uh, do that with only six months uh, preparation time. But such was the international demand uh, for Arctic cooperation that in October in 2013, more than 1,000 people came to Reykjavik for the first assembly. It became, from the very beginning, the largest annual international gathering on the Arctic. And now we have every year over 2,000 participants from 60 to, to 70 countries. And before the coronavirus uh, stopped uh, almost every kind of uh, normal human communication on uh, the planet, we had uh, just come back from India and Berlin, where we also witnessed uh, the growing uh, international engagement uh, in the Arctic. And uh, the plan of the Arctic Circle for the for next 16 months consisted of a forum in Berlin on Arctic science, especially the Mosaic expedition. In the end of August, uh, the Arctic Circle Forum in Greenland, and together with the Arctic Science Ministerial meeting in Tokyo in, uh, in November as well. And then in the beginning of next year, in the United Arab Emirates, linking uh, Arctic science to the needed research on the Himalayan glaciers and the Third Pole, and in preliminary discussions with the government of France, supported by President Macron, to have a forum uh, later in 2021 on uh, what we call Paris, the Arctic post, post, post Paris. So what we now have, in addition to all the other Arctic meetings and gatherings and organizations and platforms, an extraordinary uh, regular network and engagement by all the leading countries uh, in Asia, or on the European continent, in addition uh, to the Arctic state. So what my good friend Lasse Heinonen uh, coined uh, just about half a decade ago, the term global Arctic, and many people were surprised by that concept, has now become our everyday reality as, as we go forward. And our plans were that, of course, Arctic science would have a 
big part of the forum in Berlin. Uh, I was there just on the 9th of this month with uh, the CEO of the Arctic Circle to, uh, to, to decide on the structure with our German ministerial uh, hosts. And then, uh, as some of you know, uh, you Arctic and the Arctic Circle and the Icelandic universities uh, are planning a two days science meeting prior to the Arctic Circle assembly in uh, October. And of course, the combination of uh, the uh, third Arctic Science Ministerial meeting and uh, the Arctic Circle Forum in, in Tokyo will be uh, also a big science event. So I think no year uh, has so far seen such prominent uh, linkage of Arctic science meeting in addition to all the other meetings of Arctic science like your own and others that are taking place this, this year. And what it demonstrates, I think, and that is an extraordinary good news, that despite all the conflicts in the world and the tensions between leading states and others, we have managed somehow to create a very extensive, elaborate, productive, uh, peaceful, balanced uh, network of ongoing uh, international cooperation in the Arctic. Perhaps uh, inspired by what uh, President Putin once said, that <clears throat> the Arctic is simply too big and too much of a challenge for any one country to be able to do all the necessary research on the science and the knowledge gathering sort of on, on the Arctic. But as we move forward, let me conclude by mentioning three challenges that I think we need to speak about openly uh, and, uh, and systematically. And the first is that as we are seeing an increasing geopolitical dimension entering the Arctic uh, uh, region. Uh, and we are all aware of what happened in Finland uh, and what has uh, followed uh, from the new American administration and the reaction by all the states. So we might be in an era where the politicization of uh, the Arctic uh, becomes uh, a new element. So we have to openly and clearly express our determination that despite the song and dance, as I sometimes call, call it, on the geopolitical uh, scene with respect to the Arctic, we will, in every area of Arctic science, continue on the basis of what we have achieved so far. We cannot let the ups and downs of the politics, the new politics of the Arctic, have a slow drawing effect on uh, uh, on Arctic science cooperation or other forms of Arctic cooperation. But coming from where I come from uh, and my experience of the last uh, decades and so on, I am perfectly aware that's not easy. <laughs> that's not easy. Uh, and that's why we need to speak about it openly. We need to be aware of it and we have to express our determination to make sure it doesn't happen. The third, the, the second challenge is the challenge of communication across language barriers. It seems to me that there's an enormous amount of Arctic research going on in Russia, for example, but most of it is published in Russian. And even with all due respect to my Russian friends, having been the only so-called Western leader to have attended all of the Arctic Territory of Dialogue uh, conferences in Russia since they began a uh, long time ago when Putin was simply a prime minister of, uh, of Russia. When one attends now the bigger gatherings uh, like the last one in, in Petersburg, if one doesn't understand Russian, one loses 80-90% uh, of what is, what's going on. Similarly, I think from, for example, the Asian countries, the extraordinary Arctic institutes and the research has been done by Korea, China, Japan, and others. A lot of this is published, not in English, but in their own, in their own languages. So somehow we need to find an organized mechanism 
where we communicate globally almost every research that's being conducted in the Arctic. And maybe the coronavirus has taught us some information technology means to actually do this in real time and in a productive way. And uh, my final point is this. Uh, although, as I said in the beginning, we have all these existing uh, uh, ongoing gatherings like uh, the Arctic Circle Assemblies and Forum, we should be aware that it's not given. Uh, for example, the upcoming Arctic uh, Science Ministerial meeting, if I may say so, was an outcome of an idea I got in a taxi in Tokyo about two years ago and then proposed uh, to the Minister of Science uh, in Japan and my own ministers. There were not at that time any formalized plans, either by my own country or Japan, to actually do that. But thanks God, they have taken up that idea and are now doing it in a splendid way. So if we combine that with uh, the second meeting in Berlin, we now have some kind of a formula where the chair country of the Arctic Circle plus an observer state like Finland and Germany did before, and Iceland and Japan are doing now. So I put it to our Russian friends when they take over the chairmanship of uh, the Arctic Council that they continue this and select an observer state to host with Russia the fourth Arctic Science Ministerial meeting. But let me say again, that's not given. We have to systematically speak about it in an open way and therefore make clear that as we go forward, there will be the fourth Arctic Science Ministerial meeting, there will be the fifth Arctic Science Ministerial meeting, and so on. Uh, it was created, as we all know, uh, by the Americans during the chairmanship, and uh, we should thank them for that. Uh, the meeting in Germany came about because of the interest of the Finnish chairmanship. I just described how the upcoming meeting in Tokyo actually came about. But we also like, with the other two things, speak openly about it. How do we institutionalize the Arctic Science Ministerial meetings as we go forward? So let me simply conclude by saying as we can celebrate an extraordinary level of international cooperation in the Arctic, we should be aware that uh, there are challenges and, uh, and also barriers, and we have to deal with those so they don't slow down this fascinating, extraordinary pace of Arctic science international cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to take a few questions if they come in sure, through the sure. chat box? Yeah. Great. Yeah, um, so sure. I'll let you know if and, and when they come in. Um, we have a, a couple minutes left for questions. Um, but I guess I'll start off by saying, do you, th given the, the current changes that we've all made in terms of how we're communicating and working together right now, do you think that this is going to be change how we cooperate in the Arctic going forwards? Well, to some extent, I think it will make it easier to communicate across these uh, <clears throat> big, uh, big territories. But I've always said that part of the success of the Arctic uh, cooperation is that there is an Arctic community. We have somehow been able through these gatherings, uh, not just the Arctic Circle, but many others, uh, the gatherings relating to the Arctic Council chairmanship, the Arctic Frontiers and others. We have been able to create what I call a community of uh, scientists, experts, officials, engaged people, indigenous representatives and others. So there is a very important human uh, element, contact element, uh, live experience element of people in the Arctic coming together face to face. And to some extent that also harmonizes with the traditions of uh, the Arctic communities uh, over the centuries. So I think in order to guarantee the success, we have to be able to maintain the human interaction at at the Arctic gatherings. So I've often said one of the reasons why, for example, the new Asian powers uh, have come, what I think, respectfully into the Arctic cooperation is they were clever enough when they came to the first assemblies and the meetings of the Arctic Council uh, working groups and so on to realize that this was different 
from other international gatherings, less formalized, more based on human contacts uh, and and friendship. Great. Um, we have one other question. Um, see if you know the answer to this uh, question. If we know if there's a common database for Arctic research in different languages, building on what you proposed during your speech. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you want me to elaborate on that? Or? Yeah. Do you know if there is such a, a database right now, or any efforts to no, pull something together? No. 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 I, I mean. I always talk about the Arctic in English, as, as all of you know. But gradually, the, over the years, the last 20 years or so that I've been engaged in this, I have become more and more aware that there's a huge amount of Arctic discussion and dialogue and research and policies that is published and discussed in, in other languages. And uh, as I said before, you only have to attend the Arctic Front, uh, the Arctic Territorial Dialogue meetings uh, uh, in Russia to realize how how dominating the Russian language is uh, in that gathering. And in my cooperation with, for example, Korea, China, Japan, and so on, I've also become aware that there is a lot going on in Arctic dialogue in languages that I don't understand. So I think it's a real problem. It's a real problem because we need to be aware of what's going on. It's a part of the success uh, and also the trust, also the trust uh, that is the fundamental basis of Arctic science cooperation. And giving the modern technologies, it, and if there is a funding for it, and I think uh, the money that will be spent on building up such a database will be extraordinarily well spent. And maybe my own country, if I may propose, and Russia could start discussing um, among themselves that the joint Icelandic Russian chairmanship or the Arctic Council could, for, could establish such a, a regular database that could be funded uh, either internationally or, or by the Arctic states. Great. Thank you so much. There's another question that came in, and I wonder whether Lindsay might be able to answer it. Um, yeah. yeah, I just read it, and um, I can just say, so they are... Sorry, totally could you read out the question that you're answering? Yeah, so the question is, um, how does the Arctic Science Ministerial connect to the Arctic Council? Um, so I just do want to make it clear, they are separate entities. However, um, you know, everything that the Arctic Council does is driven by science. So the Arctic Science Ministerial really supports the science-driven work of the Arctic Council. And as you can see um, with all of the ASMs, each one has um, been in coincidence with the chairmanship of the Arctic Council. So that's no different here in Iceland. Um, the Arctic Council chairmanship is under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Arctic Science Ministerial Planning is happening in the Ministry of Education, Science and Culture, but we do work in collaboration with the chairmanship team, um, just as you know, a sounding board and discussion, but they are separate entities. But let me, let me, if I may, yeah, of course that you're right. They are formally separate entities, but the reason why we have an Arctic Science Ministerial meeting is that three chair countries of the Arctic Council, US, Finland, and Iceland, decided to do it. And that is why when you look at how the Arctic Science Ministerial meetings have come about, they are linked to the chair country of the Arctic Council engaging and deciding to take on that additional role. So as we go forward, I just emphasize, there is no guarantee there will be a fourth Arctic Science Ministerial meeting or, or the fifth one. We need to perhaps get an informal understanding that part of the role of an each chair country of the Arctic Council is to select an observer state with which they will host the next Arctic Science Ministerial meeting. If we don't do that, there is no international mechanism in existence that will guarantee the fourth or the fifth Arctic Science Ministerial meeting. 
Great. Well, I just want to be respectful of the time of our, our panelists and you participants sure, and sure, say, sure, fine, fine. no, no, thank you for all of your contributions. I know that there's still one or two questions that are coming in. Um, I'm about to post in the, the chat box um, that we also set up another Zoom room. If people want to be able to share their cameras, grab a cup of coffee, turn on your microphones and talk with each other. Um, we'll beginning, be beginning the next panel session in about 25 minutes. Um, you're welcome to stay around here, use the chat box to, to continue talking with, with your fellow participants and panelists. Um, and thank you so much for participating in this first session. Thank you.